in 2 Samuel 23. Thank you, Deacon Al, for that wonderful praise. I was telling Joel that's the way it should be every Sunday. Alright? 2 Samuel 23. We are uh, reaching what's called uh, in the Christian calendar the Advent. Okay, Advent, I think, begins tomorrow. And so for the next four weeks, we are anticipating the coming of Christ. Okay, for as Christians, we are looking uh, and, and um, getting ready to celebrate the birth of our Redeemer. And so the Advent, uh, every Sunday, there'll be a message related to that upcoming event of Christ, I mean, Christ's birth, okay? I, wanna, I want us to look at 2 Samuel in the case of uh, looking at David. Uh, David is one of my favorite characters in the Old Testament. And because he was, he was such a human being, a man, you know, a sinner like all of us, but at the same time, he was a king. And, and the theocratically, the best king Israel had. Right? the second king of Israel, and he, he really is the prototype. But at the same time, he had these tragic flaws as a, as a human being, and so I think it's a great case study. Do you guys like that title? I got that from the verse. Cool title, right? The Morning Without Clouds. Second Samuel 23. This is the end of, of David's life, and he says so. Um, it, at the first verse, he says, these are the last words of David, right? Second Samuel 23. Let's look at verse four and five. He is like the light of morning at sunrise on a cloudless morning, like the brightness after rain that brings the grass from the earth. Is that my house right with God? Another translation might be, my house is not right with God, is what he's saying. I wish it was, but it's not. Has he not made with me an everlasting covenant? And if you were in the Bible study, you know I explained it a little bit, right? Arranged and secured in every part. Will he not bring to fruition my salvation? This is again anticipation. And grant me my every desire. This is God's word. And so, as we get older, one of the <clears throat> unfortunate prospect is that we're going to face trouble, disappointment, setbacks, trials, sorrows. This is just part of life, right? Can't escape it. Doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, doesn't matter. If you live long enough, you're going to experience it. Okay? Sorrows and trials. Right? And so David, looking back at his life now, with, a, with all his ups and downs, he's sort of reminiscing, looking back, at this old soldier remembering the, camp, the camp, campaigns of his uh, war battles that he had, the injuries that he endured, and his sort of introspectively reflecting uh, his life, and yet never losing the anticipation, as our deacon up said in the prayer, looking forward, pressing onward. Okay, that is our faith. We always move forward, okay? Doing the next thing, if you will. I'll borrow that from Elizabeth Elliot. Do the next thing, right? Moving forward, advancing, pressing on. Okay? So one, we, we see David's humble confession here. In his prophetic eye, David is a man of God, in his prophetic eye anticipating the future, David looks forward to the future of the coming Messiah, the promised Savior, the seed of Abraham, the seed of David, if you will. He looks forward to the advent of the glorious kingdom in which there shall be no wickedness, and righteousness shall be the universal character of all the subjects in that kingdom, God's kingdom, in heaven. 
looking forward to the final gathering of a perfect family in which there shall be no unsound members, no defects, no sin, no sorrow, no death, no tears, as the light of the morning when the sun rises, rises, even a morning without clouds. Psalm 72, 6, 7 says this, May he come down like rain upon the mown grass, like showers that water the earth. May the righteous flourish in his days, as well as an abundance of peace until the moon is no more. Again, pressing on, looking forward with the eyes of faith, eyes of faith. Then, in reality, he turns to his family, his own life, right? One, he's looking forward. At the same time, he's dealing with reality. He's engaged in reality. And he looks at his family and he says, you know, not so with my family. He's not perfect, not free from sin, has blots and blemishes of many kinds. It has cost him many tears. He is not as he wish. As parents, we think that, do we not? It is not as I wish. And I have vainly tried to make it so. So the trials of sorrow and, and, and um, tears, he experienced many. Let me just give you a few here. Life and sorrow of trials and sorrow from his own brothers. David was the youngest. Life of sorrow and trials from the unjust persecution of Saul. King Saul was after him for decades, running from cave to cave. From his own servants, such as Job, his right-hand man. And Hephothel, another one that he relied on. They turned on him, disloyal, from his once loving wife, Michal. When David was dancing before the Lord because the ark was returned from the Philistines, he was dancing and she despised him. The how undignifying that a king should dance in public. And God cursed her. She became barren, never bore children. From his own children that he loved, Absalom, Amnon, Adinijah, rebelled against their own father, coup to overthrow him from his own subjects, these ungrateful people. They forgot what he had done, all the things he had done for them, and they drove him out of town. They rebelled against him, and he lived among the Philistines, pretending to be crazy. Some of the worst of these trials, no doubt, were the just consequences of his own sins. And yet we see the wise chastisement of a loving God the Father. Yet David was a man of sorrows. He committed some horrific sins, did he not? Committed adultery. And then he had the husband, or her husband, he orchestrated to have her husband Uriah killed. So essentially he's a murderer and an adulterer. King David. Second, where does this source of sorrow and grief predominantly come from? Right? So first we look at the humility of David's confession. Now we're going to look at where's the source? Where is it coming from? Predominantly it comes from home. Okay? From within your own household. That's your litmus test at home. It is at home that God uses the people, the family members, parents, brothers, sisters, siblings, to sanctify, separate us, and purify his people at home. So when I hear pastors like, oh yeah, you know, like I have a certain level of purity and sanctification, this and that and the other, kind of like, you know, very subtly, you know, kind of bragging how, how holy he is. First thing I'm thinking is, I want to talk to your wife. <laughs> Through home trials, God keeps us humble. He draws us to himself. He sends us to reading our Bibles, teaches us to pray. He shows us our need for Christ. 
He weans us like a child weaning away from his mother's milk, right? Off the solid food, cutting off, cut loose. He weans us from the world and the pleasure thereof. Because God knows they're short and temporary. By then, by, by home context, in the home, the trials that comes from the home, he prepares me to, again, look forward to a city whose foundation is God, whose architect is God himself, to that new city, the city of Jerusalem. Where there are no tears, no disappointments, and no sin. It is no privilege, do you understand? It's no special mark. God is not doing you a favor if you never experience trials and suffering. Because our fallen human nature needs the trials as a spiritual medicine. I need it. And as parents, three of us here, four including me, we cannot give grace to our children. You know how, no matter how devoted you may be, we cannot command success for our kids. We cannot teach. We can teach, but we can't convert. We can show where to find bread and water of life, but we cannot make them eat or drink it. You can lead the horse to water, but you can't make them drink it. I have students, college students in my Bible study group. One of them married an active, raging Buddhist. And on top of all that, he wanted me to officiate. We can point the way to eternal life, but we cannot make others walk in it. It is the Spirit, Holy Spirit, that quickens. And when the Bible talks about quickening, it means bring to life that which was dead. Okay? It's the Spirit that brings to life. God is the one and one only who gives life. God. No one else, nothing else. So, what are some of the lessons I can take away from you? Because John 1, 13 says this, right? Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or husband's will, but born of God. So what are some of the lessons here? Under the source of sorrow and grief that comes from the home. I need to manage my expectations. Okay, manage my expectation. So whether it be your home now, you know, some people are like, Thanksgiving just passed by, Thanksgiving holidays coming up, Christmas, right? And one of the people, uh, things that, one of the things that people dread is having to spend time with their family members, unfortunately, right? While the others become depressed because they have no family. That's why suicide rate spikes up during holidays. Right, so take your pick. Manage, I need to manage my expectation. So most of you have your whole life ahead of you. You're gonna to go to school, hopefully. If not, find a job somewhere. Maybe you'll get married, maybe you won't. But then you're gonna to look to things for your expectation, your pleasure. Whether it be another person, you know, relationship, whether it be your business, your job, whether it be your status, because, you know, you re reached and achieved certain status and people, yes, sir, yes, ma'am to you, you kind of enjoy that. Whatever it is, right? I need to know, know that many who expect worldly honors and expect, expect pleasures from the world die disappointed. Many, if not most, die disappointed. Psalm 62, 5 says this, Yes, my soul find rest in God. My hope comes from Him. One of the great church fathers, theologian Augustine, Bishop of Hippo in the 4th century, who tabulated the New Testament as we know it, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and so on. He said one of the reasons why we have restlessness in our heart is because my love is disorder, is chaotic. That I need to find rest first and foremost in God. That my love must be God first. More than my spouse, more than my children, more than my career, more than anything on this earth. Because it's disorder, I have idols. I make a fool of myself. I have shame and disgrace. 
because of my disorder of love. So said Gustin, Lord, you have made us for you. Therefore, give our hearts no rest until he finds his rest in thee. Augustine. His great book, City of God, volumes defending Christians, also confession. I highly recommend that you read it. Job 7 says that as sparks fly upward, so man is born for trouble. And who suffered more intensely than Job in the Old Testament? Few live without troubles, as I said earlier, right? The greater my affections, the deeper the affliction. The more I love, the more I will weep. Another lesson, God knows the perfect time to give and to take. Said Job, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh. Blessed be the name of the Lord. How many of us can say that? I don't know, to this day, I don't know not one person who really has that attitude. Because when things are taken from us, when so, things that I love is threatened, I become all so human. Right? So let me give you an example with David. So in 2 Samuel 12, 23 says this, God giveth and God taketh, right? But then God also prepares us. He prepares my heart. I think I was sharing this in a Bible study on Wednesday night. I had a couple that come in in an ER. The wife was dying of lung cancer, and the man was about my age, a Korean man. Uh, he was speaking to me in English and Korean, as I was to him. And he said, my heart is ready. I'm attributed so. He's going to see his wife die. In the next six hours, she will be dead. With tears coming down his face, he says, I am prepared to let her go. 2 Samuel 12, 23, but now that he is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. The first child that, that David and Bathsheba had in their adulterous union, God takes that child. And yet, David, perhaps God will show favor. Praise, fast. But the baby does. And when the baby is dead, he gets up, washes his face, puts on new clothes, and goes to Bathsheba and comforts her. He is prepared. His heart was ready. Right? But not always. Because in 2 Samuel 18, 33, the king was shaken. This is King David. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. As he went, he said, oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, the most handsome and beautiful man in all the land of Israel, who openly sinned in public, sleeping with his father's concubines. What David did in secret, Absalom does in public. If only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son Absalom. He cannot bear it. David will not be consoled. I see mothers with dead, dead babies clutching the dead baby. She will not be consoled, no matter what I say. No matter what I say. As if. I lost my mother during COVID two and a half years ago. <laughs> Make the long story short, more or less, I was prepared. No goodbyes, sudden and quick, no holding hands, no shedding tears, couldn't even see her. She died alone. David loved his son Absalom, even though this son, this wretched son, rebelled against him, trying to take the kingdom away from his own father. Oh, my son Absalom, 
my son Absalom. I only have one son. Our deacon Kim only has one son. Psalm 31, 15, my times are in your hands, O Lord. Deliver me from the hands of my enemies, from those who pursue me. My times are in his hands. All our times are in his hands. Third and final, I need you to pay attention here, okay? Covenant, what does this mean? Covenant simply means, if I, if I can, is one who keeps his promise. God is a promise keeper. We are promise breakers. Covenant, the way we can understand it, is a vow between a man and a wife when they get married, right? On their, on their wedding day. They make vows to one another. It is when you go to court of law and you have to testify. You swear it off. We could appreciate that, right? That makes it binding. It makes it legit. I am under the authority of that oath, of that vow. Covenant, from God's perspective, is mysterious. And though David says, though my house is not as I could wish, and is the cause of much sorrow, God has made with me an everlasting covenant. Again, looking forward. Order in all things and sure. And then he adds, this is all my salvation in all my house. So the covenant that God has with us, this eternal being, who had no beginning, is deep and mysterious. That's applied to us nonetheless. For in God, he has graciously been pleased to accommodate himself to us who are poor, weak in our faculties, and we can but little grasp it. He pours out that benefit in this Trinitarian God, this Trinity of Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. In order to benefit, to give, and to share his love to us. It is a mysterious and ineffable arrangement where all things necessary for salvation of our souls, our present peace in my daily grind, and our final glory are fully and completely provided from all eternity past, not yesterday, not last year. This has a profound effect, if you think about it, that God loved me before the creation of the world. That when God says I love you, or when I discern that I, he, I know that he loves me, he cannot love me more than when he first says I love you. Think about that for a second. We, when I say I love you, that love may it's ab and flow. It may grow. It may decrease. It changes, unfortunately. But with God, it is absolute and complete. When he first says, I love you, he cannot love me more than that. It is astounding declaration. And so this Godhead, in their joint work, Father, Son, and the Spirit, reveals himself, mainly and primarily through his son, Jesus Christ, the redeeming, purchasing work of God the Son by dying as our substitute on the cross, the drawing work of God the Father, choosing and drawing us to the Son, and the sanctifying, separating work of the Holy Spirit, wakening, quickening, renewing my fallen nature. That the word of God begins to Shake me. I find interest in it. I don't reject it. I don't fall asleep from it. I actually read it. It is all contained in this covenant that I need between now and here until glory. And who is this person that actualizes this covenant? and his blessings. 
You got it. Christ our Lord. Christ our mediator. Hebrews 12, 24 says this, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkling blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. And so I see David, in his, with, with the eyes of faith, he sees this covenant, the blessings, benefits conveyed to him, and the promise that God has made to him, to David, the coming king, the eternal king, who is king of, the, king of kings and lord of lords. Psalm 89, 28, I will maintain my love to him forever, and my covenant with him will never fail. The eternal covenantal blessings are tied mystically and bodily and passed in and through Christ as our head, rendering security, trust, assurance. Right? This was the great covenantal binding benefit and comfort that David had in view. Even though he was looking at the reality of his family. This is what galvanized him. The Lord says to my Lord, I don't know if any of you can grasp this, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool of your feet, Psalm 110, 1. When your days, 2 Samuel 7, 12, when your days are finished and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you, God speaking to David, who will come from you and I will establish his kingdom. This is the promise that God makes to David, thousands of years before the birth of Christ. When you look at Matthew 1, if you're reading your Bible, you see the genealogy of Jesus. His line, his royal line goes to David, legitimizing Jesus as a man, fully God, fully man, but as a man that legitimizes his royal line. Family tree goes to David, his great, great, great granddaddy. And yet, David says, the Lord, God says to my Lord, one who is to come, the Messiah, sit at my right hand, right? Sit at, uh, uh, sit near me, if you will, until I make all things right, until I make your enemies a footstool for you. This is a profound statement, right? David had the privilege of having a glimpse of that. What if someone told you something really wonderful? I don't mean some, some, you know, shamanistic, you know, tarot card, palm reading nonsense, but someone who has prayed for you long and hard, maybe like your parents, maybe, one of your parents, and they have this conviction validated by the word and says to you, my son, my daughter, this is the impression this is the word that God has given you. But you! Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that give you assurance? So the consolation, the comfort comes in the midst of my daily grind, the sorrows and trials that I go through, is that, is that my, it's not just my attitude, but the word of God strengthens me for duty, comforts me in trial. I learn to fight Christ's battles. And I realized once again that this is all arranged from endless ages long before I was born. So it's the providence of God. Not that, not that it destroys my responsibility. I'm not a fatalist. But it affords me practical and cordial comfort to combat disappointments and sorrows in life. What we know not now, we shall know hereafter. Right now, it's kind of like on a needs basis, right? No basis needs be. And so I need to drink that bitter cup now and then. And yet there is this wise cause for every loss and bereavement under which we mourn. Because God says, I know every hair that you have on your head. Not a sparrow will fall to the ground without me knowing. Sparrow, a, a little bird, was worth half a cent in the ancient times. Half a cent. 
Something completely insignificant. God says, I'd see, I recognize. You can't be more intimate in that metaphorical language than to say, I know every hair, I can count every hair that you have on your head. Right? And so this, this morning without clouds, the second advent for us then, David was anticipating the coming of the Messiah, but we are anticipating, anticipating the coming of the return of his Christ. Are we not? Right? So Romans 8, 22 says this. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. We go through this day, this week, the year, the season, right? Good things, bad things, mixed. You fight with your parents. Your parents chastise you, vice versa. People in your school and in your commute and the people you work with, right? Good and bad and everything in between. And so we groan, we groan. And I have to tell you again, okay? Not just to give you a shock, but the horrific disease that I see at the hospital, in the ICU. People intubated with five, six tubes coming out of their body. The geriatrics, people who are 70 and 80, 70 years old and 80, the stench in that hallway. Hmm? It is horrific. Some people die completely alone. No visitors, no anyone. Die without family, die without Christ. How tragic is that? Incurable diseases, isolation, loneliness, widowhood, orphans. We are having a war, even as I speak. How many years now? Huh? Psalm 17, 15, my hope again is in him. Hebrews 4, 15 says this, we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, tempted in every way, yet without sin. He is my high priest. He forgives all my sins. He shows me his mercy, sympathy, love, goodness. He can feel because he has touched my infirmity. God has, right? And on the cross, Jesus looks to one of his disciples and, and rearranges the family relationship. He tells John, I think, that behold your mother. Woman, behold your son. Right? His own mother. He's thinking about his mother. Because she's going she's gonna to be bereaved of her son. She's going to lose her son. When I think about that, <clears throat> as I was preparing, when I think about that, boy, I have a lot to apologize when I get to heaven to my mother. Because all I gave her was grief and gray hair. Reunion. This is the bitter sweetness of a Christian. And I see this and I appreciate this more than ever when, I, when I'm at the bedside, on the deathbed of these patients. And those that are believers, they are expecting to go, go into heaven. There is a celebration. There is this quiet joy. First Thessalonians 4.14, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Asleep in that context is a euphemism for dead. Right? We will be re reunited with those that you love. He would never have us forget our departed friends in Christ. They're not lost. They're only gone before us. They're just gone before us. We shall see them again in the day of gathering together for them that asleep in Jesus, God will bring with him. We shall see them in renewed bodies, know them again, but better, more beautiful, more happy than we ever saw them on earth. Best of all, we shall see them with a comfortable feeling that we meet to part no more. Part no more. 
One of the saddest things that we experience is departure, right? When you say goodbye. Hmm? Isn't that sad? Especially when you have a lot of affection and, and love for that person and you have to separate and say goodbye. I remember uh, I had this <clears throat> group when I was uh, a young pastor and um, they were my first college group and I was their first pastor and we had this tight bond. And then when they graduated, you know, one by one, they all leave, you know, for a job here, job there, whatever, whatever. And it was really sad. Right? Say goodbye. How do I then combat, fight against these troubles that I have, disappointments that I have? Right? The best remedy and soothing medicine is to be useful to others. Okay? Instead of being self-absorbed and all about me, you need to kind of look outward. How can I help others? That cures my own bitterness and selfishness and melancholy. Right? I lay myself out there to make sor sorrow less and the joy greater in this sin burden world. To comfort and to bless. To find a balm for woe. To tend the lone and fatherless is angels' work below. Often when I, when I uh, drive home on Sundays, <clears throat> there's a lot of, not a lot, but quite a few homeless people on the highway, on FDR. They're in between lanes. They're straddling lanes and they're begging. And sometimes I reach out and I, you know, give a few dollars. Others, other times I just drive by. But every time I drive by, there's a bit of guilt, I don't know, discomfort. Right? Not that I need to cater to every homeless person. In fact, I just one met today when I pulled up here, this lady. She caught me at the perfect time. She goes, I was ready to go into service, but I didn't want to disrupt the service, so can you help me? I'm hungry. Psalm 41.1, blessed, happy are those who have regard for the weak. The Lord delivers them in times of trouble. We, if you say you're a Christian, I am the hands and feet of Christ. I, I shed light. I bring comfort in spite of my own hurt. You understand? In spite of my own pain. And when I do that, the darkness lifts, light shines. This is the way God would have us act. Acts 10.38, I'm going to end right here, okay, Chris? How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. Now he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Should we be more like him? He who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many? If you say you're a Christian, right? Selfish feeding on my own troubles and lazy pouring over my own sorrows is just feeding my melancholy and darkness and misery. In trusting God as my savior, I not only get healed of my own issues and depression, yeah, I'm using that word clinically, depression, but it takes away the bitterness and I refocus on the coming Messiah and it gives me this quiet joy and confidence. If you don't believe me, try it. Experience it. Read the word. Seek God. You will have it. Let's pray.